I want to start the evening with an impersonation of Richard Bausch. <laughs> How y'all doing? <laughs> y'all right? Um, oh. Did y'all even hear the Bowser impersonation? <laughs> How y'all doing? Y'all right? Um, I'm delighted, as always, to be at Suwannee. Um, thank you, Wyatt, for for having me back. Um, and I just want to thank the staff who make me seem more competent than I actually am. And I want you all to remember that, that the staff is so remarkable. Most of these people are published authors and, and college professors. I feel kind of creepy every time I ask one of them for a Diet Coke. So. <laughs> um, I just love being here. It's like um, being at a family reunion with attractive, smart people. <laughs> um, I'm going to do something tonight that I've never done here before. I'm going to part of what I'm going to read tonight. I've read here before. Um, tonight is part of a short story. When I read it before. It was chapter one of a novel. Over the years here, I've, I've read a handful of chapter ones of novels <laughs> that never became novels. Um, it's not so much that I lost interest in them as they lost interest in me. Um, I found that somewhere, the novels that I started often started them for the wrong reasons. You know, I. I, w I would write one because my agent thought it was a good idea for me to write one. I, w I would start one because my agent said, oh, if you publish a book of short stories, it will actually damage your career. <laughs> I've since fired that agent. But um, four years ago, I, uh, I read a chapter one called Mr. Tall. And um, it was the start of a novel. And, but it really wasn't. It just turns out it was, it was a short story that I like a lot. But the last two years, I've read chapter two and chapter three, and I really didn't want to write them. My heart wasn't in them. And chapter three last year, I wrote only to read at this conference. But I've since had a change of heart, and I've re-embraced the short story. And now my motto is um, repurpose, reuse, recycle. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to dedicate this reading to Andrew Hudgens, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, the story I'm going to read tonight is called Jack and the Mad Dog. <laughs> Jack, that Jack, the giant killer of the stories, spent the better part of the evening squatting in the blackberry briars opposite the house of a farm wife who would, for four dollars, but with no particular enthusiasm, lean over her husband's plow and let a boy have a go. It could happen. <laughs> she was to step into her yard and fling a rock across the road when her husband went to sleep. Jack was to meet her behind the barn, money in hand. This farm wife was widely known to possess both a strong arm and noteworthy accuracy. And to the rabble who frequented the briar patch, her flung invitations often seemed more punitive than hospitable. So Jack waited in the briars, the black shapes of the berries playing against the less black sky, the berries not quite bright, ripe on a spot in the dirt worn bare by waiting farm boys, the summer air as close and fetid as the breath of a cat, and tried not to think about the whore-flung, judgment-seeking meteorite that might at any moment drop out of the sky and render him senseless. <laughs> he waited and drank odd-tasting white liquor out of an indifferently washed mason jar until he came into a cloudy, metallic, buzzy-headed drunk. The liquor had been a welcome, if, as it turned out, not entirely pleasant surprise. He had found it sitting upright in the middle of the road, the lid of the jar screwed on tight, 
as he had set out on his carnal errand. Jack had often... I love y'all. Jack had often found along the road the things he needed most on his travels, so he assumed he needed the moonshine as well. It had smelled all right enough, just a little off, overcooked maybe, so he took a drink. When he did not die or get carted off by witches, he took another. <laughs> now, now he squatted and waited and drank, sucked on the sour berries, flinching beneath his hat every time he thought about the rock with his name on it, until both feet went to sleep and the mosquitoes found him in his unlikely lair, thinking, I'm Jack, that Jack, the giant killer of the stories, and my life has come down to this. <laughs> and still the farm wife did not sling her stone. Her husband, the farmer, did not grow sleepy. Jack watched the man smoking on the front porch, the red eye of his homemade cigarette staring out toward the blackberry briars where Jack stared back with increasing agitation. The farmer's shape was distinct, the outline of his sad farmer's hat plain, lit by that single small flare which, the more Jack drank, began to leave fire trails in the darkness as the farmer moved the cigarette between his mouth and the spot where he rested his hand on the arm of the chair. The farmer smoked one cigarette after another until the hour grew late and the night grew long, until the katydids grew tired of their chanting and the crickets tuned down, until all hope passed away from the world, until Jack's hoosh, hooch and patience dripped away, until that finally was that. Jack drained the last of the liquor out of the jar, grimaced, wretched, swallowed bile, bad liquor, and a gut full of green blackberries. He stood up, the briars ripping at his clothes, and with a great shout of what he meant to be a curse, but came out instead as an animal blare that made no sense even to him, he threw the empty jar across the road toward the farmhouse where it landed in the yard without even breaking. Jack cocked an ear, listened, waited for the man on the porch to curse back to yell, Who's out there? To fire his shotgun into the darkness, to storm down off the porch, spoiling to fight the man who had come sneaking onto his property to buy a $4 piece of his wife. <laughs> but the farmer did not make a sound, did not move, sat instead smoking on his porch, placid as a steer, shallow as a mud hole, as if strangers shouting from the briars and mason jars falling from the sky were every night occurrences. Jack fully expected to have to kill the man. For in the stories, he had often killed men who kept him away from a woman. In his experience, such men always needed killing. <laughs> Unless the woman turned out to be a witch, in which case he killed her instead. But the man didn't stand up, didn't speak, didn't flick his cigarette out into the yard, nothing. Son of a bitch, Jack thought. He's sitting there chewing his cud. It was more than Jack could bear. Cud chewer, he yelled. <clears throat> Going home, Jack, the farmer said from the porch. How do you know it's me? <laughs> At the time, he considered this a clever question. No response came from the porch. How about I come over there with a silver axe and chop your head off? You ain't gonna do no such thing, Jack. Go on home and get into bed. How about I send my magic beating stick over there to beat you about the ears until you run off down the road and nobody never hears from you again. Then you'll be sorry. <laughs> Jack, the farmer said patiently, everybody knows you ain't got no magic beating stick no more. You ain't had one since I don't know when. Now head on out. I'll, Jack said, considering as he spoke an unexpectedly depleted list of options. I'll come over there and play a trick on you. I'm still smarter than you are. Not tonight, you ain't. I'm on to you and your giant killing ways. There ain't gonna be no jack tail around here tonight. Ha! Jack hollered. There already is, and you're in it. 
It just ain't a very good one. <laughs> I'll grant you that, said the farmer. Jack stood quietly for a moment. Oh, come on, he pleaded. Just one little slice. All you have to do is go to sleep. It's late. Ain't you got milking and plowing to do in the morning? Ain't that rooster going to crow before you know it? Jack, the farmer chided sadly. What? Don't beg. You used to be somebody. <laughs> Disappointed in more ways than he could count. Drunk, but not pleasantly so. Both legs asleep all the way up to his hip bones. Jack climbed from the briars and set out. He was not, so far as he knew, setting out to find a job of work, nor a girl to marry, nor new ground to clear. He was not even leading a cow. He did not expect that he would, at the end of this setting out, sordid though it was, encounter an imbecilic king, inexplicably enraged at the sight of Jack whistling down the road, or a greedy giant, or a giant greedily clutching a gold shitting goose in an improbably suspended castle or a coven of witches yowling from a derelict mill in a fury of feline estrus. He did not, to be honest, even feel like fooling with kings and giants, each of whose killings, despite the inevitable mental and physical challenges, still amounted to nothing more than a job of work. But he thought might, it might be okay to taunt and kill some witches once he sobered up, especially if they were good looking although he could not remember the last time he had seen a witch, good-looking or not. The witches had gone off somewhere, along with the silver axes and his magic beaten stick and the geese and the giants and the swaying bean trees, along with the kings and their bejeweled, creamy daughters and glittering hordes of gold. Tonight, all he had was the setting out itself, so he set out. He trudged along, intent on forgetting his lust for the doughy expanse of the farm wife's lunar bottom, his squatting in the briars like a stray dog waiting to steal a scrap, his rising black hatred of farmers and all things agricultural, <laughs> until he stepped unexpectedly into a compensatory truth he could see in the dark. In a single miraculous moment, the road beneath his feet virtually invisible the moment before, unspooled into the distance before him, silverly and faintly glowing, a still river lit by stars or the thinnest slice of moon. Yet the sky contained neither stars nor moon, just the low black night pushing down. Huh, Jack said. He could see the tall corn on both sides of the road attentively pressing in, he could see not only the wooded ridges which bordered the fields, but the thick summer foliage billowed and full blooming on the ridges steep sides. He could see the ancient giant trod mountains in the distance beyond the ridges, separated from the black of the sky by faint bands of light which shimmered and held colors Jack could not name, colors that vanished if he tried to look at them directly, angels or ghosts or shy pale brides undressing in darkened rooms. The light wasn't dawn, or even the idea of preceding dawn, which still lay hours away, but something Jack had never seen before, something he was sure no one else had ever seen, something that only he could see. The world itself was lit from within. The ridges glowed, the corn in the fields, the road, the mountains, everything he could see gave off a secret light. When he held his hand in front of his face, it too shimmered, and he studied it, his good right hand, a fine thing, well-shaped and strong, a hand as adept at caressing a virgin as plunging a silver sword into the disbelieving eye of a giant. All around his raised hand, wherever he looked, the world revealed itself the way creation must have revealed itself to God, everything part of the greater light, and it was good, and he stood there dazzled and proud and happy, once again Jack the giant killer, the best man in the world. So he whistled along, twirling his Saturday hat on his finger, hoping now for a proper tail, when he reached a good-sized creek spanned by a narrow bridge. As he stepped onto the planking, 
he savored for a moment a breath of vestigial excitement, the anticipation he had once felt every time he crossed a bridge. Perhaps this first step would presage not only a pedestrian traveling from here to there, but a crossing over from this into that, a passing into proper story. He hoped briefly for a troll to flummox, but remember that trolls were now extinct, save for a non-breeding pair locked up in a zoo in Romania. <laughs> Jack was halfway across the creek when a large black dog rose up out of the bridge, simply squeezed itself into being out of the bridge's black wood. Y'all grab that leash, okay? <laughs> Jack stopped in his tracks. He wasn't afraid, startled a little, maybe at the dog's sudden appearance, but not afraid. Over the years, he had learned that nothing really bad ever happened to him, that he was impervious to injury, if not embarrassment, no matter how formidable the adversary or unexpected its appearance. Learning that he didn't have to be afraid, however, in an almost tragic irony, also robbed him of corollary excitement. Why, the last time he had rousted out a giant, however long ago that had been, it was all he could do to make himself run. Urgh, said the dog. <laughs> Howdy, said Jack. It was his experience that sometimes animals could talk, and sometimes they couldn't but that had always paid to find out. <laughs> he could see the dog's white teeth as it snarled, its slobber lapping lengthy red tongue. Hello, Jack. <laughs> the dog had a low voice and spoke, <laughs> and spoke wetly deep in its throat. So tell me, Jack said, noting that the dog knew his name but still wanting to get on with things. Why are you impeding my progress across this here bridge? Because that is my solitary calling. <laughs> Where'd you come from? I don't know. <laughs> A minute ago, I wasn't here, but now I am. <laughs> Jack nodded. Limited omniscient narrator, he said. <laughs> rub it in. <laughs> the two spent an expected moment in silence, as if they were actors strutting and fretting, each thinking that the other had forgotten the next line. Jack finally clamped his hat on top of his head. Well, Skippy, or whatever your name is, this has been interesting and all, but why don't you step to one side and let me pass so I can get along with my setting out? I'm afraid I can't do that. A flicker of impatience flared distantly behind Jack's eyeballs. He remembered that he was still drunk, but not pleasantly so. That the farmer, simpleton though he was, had smoked him out of dipping his wick. That the summer, <laughs> that the summer night was still chokingly close and humid. A licorous headache began to mold itself into something that felt like a thumb and jab repeatedly against the backside of his forehead bone. Look, he said, pinching the bridge of his nose. I don't know what kind of story you think this is, but I can see in the dark, and I was enjoying it, even though I'm drunk, but not pleasantly so. And I don't want to fool with no talking dog. <laughs> you don't have any choice, the dog said. What do you mean I ain't got a choice? By God, I'm Jack. I've always got a choice. Not tonight, you don't. I'm going to bite you before you get off this bridge. <laughs> That's how this story goes. Shit, said Jack. You ain't going to bite me. The dog sank into a crouch. Jack, I was put on this earth to bite you. <laughs> Whoa, now, Jack said spitting out a laugh as if it tasted bad. You ain't supposed to bite me. There ain't never been nobody 
bite me. Not ever in all these many years. <laughs> said the dog. Wait a minute, Jack said. Just hold what you got and let me think. His setting out had arrived at an arrival he was unprepared to ponder. He hadn't met an old man on the road to tell him he would meet a dog on a bridge and give him a silver sword or magic words with which to kill it. Jack had always counted on the utilitarian, if narratively implausible, appearance of the old man, <laughs> bearing implements and instruction. But somewhere along the way, the old man had disappeared too. Now he was by himself in the bridge, on a bridge in the middle of the night, suddenly tired, his mind lightly fogged by odd-tasting liquor, struggling to think of a way to outsmart a talking dog. He looked around. There wasn't even a non-magical stick lying about, <laughs> nor a tree to climb in the corn bottoms. Still, in his younger days, this problem wouldn't have given him pause. Come on, Jack, he thought. You're Jack. Think of something. This is the last Jack tale. The dog said, inching closer, the end of the story. Jack backed up a step. Just hold on there, Spot. <laughs> but before you bite me, I need to know something. Are you mad? The dog stopped. Angry? Somewhat, I suppose. <laughs> no, Jack said, I meant rabid. Uh, said the dog. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I feel a little hindered in my hindquarters. <laughs> so once you bite me, I'll die a slow and excruciatingly painful death. That's the idea. <laughs> Jack finally searched through his overalls, but found only four dollars. He didn't even have a pocket knife. Without further warning, the dog scrabbled forward and leapt at Jack. Jack managed to take a step backward as it leapt and wrap his hands around its neck mid-leap and keep it at arm's length. He fell down on top of it, pinning the dog's head and chest to the bridge. Ow, said the dog. <laughs> as the dog scrabbled around with its back legs trying to find purchase, Jack squeezed its neck as hard as he could. Each of his fingers sought its correspondent on the other hand interlocking as if playing the child's game of building a church. Here's the people, Jack thought. He felt the dog gathering its front legs underneath its body, testing Jack's weight. Jack soon realized he could neither choke the dog to death nor hold it for very long. It was one big dog. Damn you, dog, Jack panted. You should not have done that. He felt the dog calmly push up against his chest, preparatory to bucking him off. You're done, the dog said. Once I stand up, it's all over. I am not done, Jack said. For the last time, I am Jack, which means nothing. <laughs> I'm important to people. Not anymore. Not any substantive way. The day, is soon, <laughs> the day is soon coming when your stories will be told only by faux mountaineers in new overalls to ill-informed tourists at storytelling festivals. <laughs> Well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> it's her sats, Jack. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. It means you're dead already, and you don't even know it. As Jack felt the dog's muscles tense, he grabbed a fistful of fur in each hand. When the dog pushed itself to its feet, Jack stood and spun in a tight circle, lifting the dog off the ground by its head, and with a great shout, threw it off the bridge. Then Jack ran. By the time he heard the dog hit the water, he had already crossed the creek. Jack didn't know where he was going, only that going seemed to be a good idea, that his setting out needed to be speeded up. <laughs> Hiding seemed advisable. He ran a few steps down the road, angling toward the creek bottom, gaining speed with each stride. He leapt from the road over the gully, his legs running through the air, his arms waving in a vain search for flight. 
He landed on both feet in the sandy soil of the bottom and with another step crashed into the thick corn. He knew that the dog would soon struggle up through the matted underbrush along the creek and set itself on his trail. The corn was fully tasseled, six and eight feet tall. Actually, my people would say tasseled. Corn was fully tasseled, six and eight feet tall, its ears hardening, two hot weeks away from coming ripe. It reached out and grabbed Jack as he fought through it. It struck at him with its thin, pointed fist. It slid its thick stalks and ropey roots beneath his feet to trip him. It became a congregation of angry Baptists. Preachers and deacons and teetotalers and desiccated spencers and dentists and disaffected undipped Methodists <laughs> rattling with judgment and contempt as he fought through it. Jack, the corn called in multitudinous chorus, you're a fornicator and a murderer and a thief. Let me go, corn, Jack spat. He lowered his head and struck back wildly with his arms. And you're a ne'er-do-well and a swindler and a liar. I am not a swindler. <laughs> the truth is not in you, Jack. For shame, you swindled your own brothers. They had it coming. You disappointed your mother. Don't you talk about mama. <laughs> Repent, cried the corn. Repent. Go shuck yourself, snarled Jack. <laughs> Behind him he could hear, or thought he could hear, imagined he could hear, the dog huffing with deadly inevitability, bullying after him in a rabid, straight, unalterable line. Jack fled and fought and cursed with the rage of the unredeemed and the panic of the pursued. He struggled wildly through miles and hours and years and lifetimes of corn and space break and the exposition Im implied therein imagining with each step the rabid fangs of the black dog inches from his hamstrings. After an age and a day, he crashed suddenly and unexpectedly out of the corn and sprawled headlong into a prairie of golden wheat. For a long moment, he lay face down on the ground, his nose filled with the rich anesthetic smells of earth and grain, and considered falling simply into sleep dog or no dog, he had come a long way. But when he thought about the death that awaited him should the dog catch him, or any death at all for that matter, he climbed wearily to his feet and stared toward the horizon where he could at least make out a tree line no more than a smudge between the field and the sky who knew how many miles of distant but a destination to aim for nonetheless, a place to flee to. As he took a first weary step toward the trees, a young girl, maiden age, sprang with a yelp from the wheat in front of him and lit out across the field. Before Jack could even cry out, the wheat around him exploded with girls. Hundreds, thousands, <laughs> multitudes of girls, flushed like succulent quail bounding toward the distant trees. They cried out, Daddy, Daddy, and help me, help me, and save me, save me, as they leapt gracefully through the wheat. Maidens, Jack thought, breaking unconsciously into a jog. Look at all the maidens. <laughs> maidens with flushed and glowing complexions of peach and cream and alabaster and ivory, clad uniformly in simple country dresses of virginal white, each dress cut perhaps a size too small and a smidge too short. Maidens whose firm flanks fetchingly swayed and flounced. <laughs> Their downy bosoms heaving and swelling. Maidens whose flaxen and wheat and chestnut and mahogany and ebony and sable and scarlet and crimson hair billowed and flowed and streamed out behind them. Maidens whose panted exhalations were sweet and soft and breathy and catching. 
maidens whose mysterious and dark and deathless and cerulean and emerald eyes were flashing and shining. In other words, lots and lots of maidens. <laughs> Jack broke into a run. He loved nothing more than maidens. <laughs> he wondered wildly if it were possible to herd all of the girls into one place, like a pasture or a feedlot. <laughs> hey, he called, come back. Jack soon gained ground and fell in behind a pair of twins whose fair hair cascaded behind them in fragrant waves. <laughs> The girls ran and leapt in step, and their silken hair undulated in hypnotic unison. Jack watched their hair for a distance. The girls seemed to have no idea that he was there. But the moment his eyes strayed below their narrow waist, the girls stopped and whirled on him so quickly that he almost shot them. He managed to bring himself to a teetering, arm-waving halt. What do you think you're doing? Asked one. Doing? Jack panted. I'm running away from a rabid black dog that can talk. What do you think I'm doing? That's not what she meant, said the other. What she meant was, what do you think you're looking at? Looking at? Jack said, looking away. I'm not looking at anything. Liar, said the first. You were looking at our fair nether parts, said the second. <laughs> Asses, said her sister. <laughs> I was not. You were too. Then tell me this, Jack said shrewdly. If you were running away from me, how can you know I was looking at your asses? <clears throat> because we know, Jack. We know. You think we don't know, but we know. Girls always know. Hmm, Jack said. I guess I knew that. <laughs> Next, you're going to look at our breasts, the first said. I am not. You are too, said the second. The twins stared at Jack until he blinked. Then he looked at their chests. <laughs> he tried not to, but he did. <laughs> and there they were, maiden bosoms, downy, heaving, swelling, tumescent. the ripe pomegranates of the Old Testament. <laughs> the top buttons of the girls' dresses strained nobly to restrain them. <laughs> Jack thought, damn! <laughs> he thought, God Almighty, italics his. He felt his manhood stirring, or his loins. He could never tell them apart. <laughs> See, said one. Told you, said the other. Jack smiled what he hoped was an old-fashioned Jack smile. Do I know you, he asked. Do you know us, said one, shaking her head sadly. Do you know us? Oh, you know us, said the other. The first time we set eyes on you, you came whistling down the road looking for a job of work after you're setting out. You had the dinner your poor old mama made for you slung over your shoulder on a pole, but the dust on the road had made you powerful thirsty and you had not a drop to drink. Mama never remembered to sit along, send along water, Jack said. It was a shortcoming. You came upon me first, I was sitting by the roadside, weaving a basket of golden straw for to carry eggs to the market. You asked me to draw you a dip of, wa dip of water from the well. And I was sitting in the doorway of our daddy's sturdy house, churning a bait of butter for to bake a cake. Then you asked me to draw you a cup of water from the well. You sure did drink a lot of water. Was your daddy a farmer? Miller, said both. Ah, said Jack. For one sweet moment, he sensed more than remembered the rhythmic screech of a turning wheel, the gentle shush, shush, 
shush of water splashing, a slant of silver moonlight, an intake of breath as soft as the noise made by the wings of a moth. But he couldn't conjure the face of a girl. So many maidens, so many meals. Twins, though. He thought he would have remembered twins. <laughs> that night at supper, while our daddy was eating his vittles and eyeballing his shooting gun leaning by the doorstop, you tricked him into giving you his silver sword and ten bags of gold. We still don't know how you pulled that one off. Then you slipped him a, sleep, a sleeping draft that made him snore so that the door joggled and the roof shook and nobody never heard the like then or now. You met me in the mill when the black cat mewled and lay with me in the moonlight on the toe sacks of meal our daddy had ground by day. Then you lay with me on the same toe sacks when the old owl hooted three times in the sweet gum tree. Jack tasted a whiff of the bad liquor he had drunk. He felt another stirring, not of loin, but of remorse. The feeling was unfamiliar, and he did not care for it. What was wrong with him? If the three of them managed to get away from this dog, why couldn't he lay with them again? He was Jack, after all. That Jack! But instead he swallowed. He said, forgive me, but I'm not sure you remember us. I, I'm sorry, no, I... He leaned forward and looked intently into the eyes of one girl and then the eyes of the other. They're not limpid pools of amber, Jack, said the first. They're light brown. And they're not shining or flashing or burning with passion. They're just eyes. Jack looked back and forth between their lovely faces with increasing consternation. Why couldn't he remember? It's just as well you don't recollect us. We were 15, Jack. 15. I know, he said. I mean, were you? I mean, I guess I know that now because you just told me. The girls stared at him, their eyes slowly lowering. It, it was wrong what happened, wasn't it? It was wrong, Jack. It was wrong before you even set out on your setting out. The liquor roiled in Jack's stomach. Inside his head, he felt himself stepping off down an unfamiliar road. No good lay at its end. The way was dark and cold, and he was alone and growing older with each step. He couldn't find his shoes. Jagged stones bruised and cut his feet. What happened after I left, he asked his voice falling so that he could barely hear it. Tell me what happened next. One girl shrugged. Why, nothing happened, Jack. Daddy never woke up from the sleeping draft he gave him. He, he kept snoring so the door joggled and the roof shook and nobody never heard the like, except us. We were the only people about the settlement once you left. Eventually the mill rotted down and the dam gave way and the great wheel tipped and toppled into the ivy where it lays to this day. But what happened to you? Jack whispered, tell me what happened to you. Me? I just sat by the side of the road weaving a basket of golden straw for to take eggs to the market. And I sat in the doorway churning a bait of butter for to bake a cake. And nobody else came down the road not ever, for ages and ages. Till the day I looked up and saw a big black dog standing on the hilltop, I did not like the looks of him. So I grabbed up my sister and off we ran down the road. And after an age and a day of running down the road and fighting through the corn, here we are, the other girl said, sweeping her arm around the wheat field. Here we are. Jack looked nervously over his shoulder. A few more girls, stragglers, splashed out of the corn. They looked haggard, their simple country dresses soiled and torn. They leapt tiredly by and stared at Jack as they passed. He saw in their eyes that they recognized him, but nobody smiled and nobody waved and nobody stopped. Nobody asked for his help. He forgot to look at their fair nether parts as they ran away. Jack turned to the twins. All these girls, he said, I, yep, some of them twice. Are you proud of yourself, Jack? That's what we want to know, Jack. That's what we want to know, Jack, that Jack. Tell us, are you proud? 
Jack was ashamed of what he had done. Maybe all the way ashamed for the first time in his life, but still in his most secret heart he wished that he had counted as the girls ran away. Well, he admitted, maybe I might. Then what are their names? demanded one. Names? Jack said. You heard her, their names. Jack realized he had never known any of their names. They had all been farmer's daughters and miller's daughters and king's daughters. Uh, he said, Susan? No, Jack, none of us never got names. The same way none of us never got more than the one white dress to wear and it too tight, not even after you saw to it we needed a different color. You never saw fit to ask us our names. Not even after you lay with us. Jack remembered then, as clearly as if he were there, the rhythmic screech of a turning wheel, the hush, hush, hush of water falling, a dagger of silver moonlight, a girl lying on a sack, stack of sacked cornmeal, her white dress pushed above her waist. She said, I don't know, Jack, I don't know. But what had that meant, the I don't know? He dug the heels of his hands into his eyes. What he most wanted most right then was to forget that he had ever set foot in that mill, that he had ever set out down that road that led to that mill. But he could smell the corn dust, hear the wheel, the water, an intake of breath as soft as the noise made by the wings of a moth. Make it stop, Jack begged. Make it stop. It ain't going to stop, Jack. You drank the sea in juice. The what? The sea and juice. You drank it all up out of the jar we put in the road. That's why you can see in the dark. Oh no, Jack wailed. I should have known. Y'all are witches. I thought all the witches was gone. Y'all done gave me a potion. We're not witches, Jack, and not maidens. We're just girls. We got the sea and juice from the old man beside the road. He said it was something you needed. We put it in the middle of the road so that you would find it on your setting out. Then we run into the corn because we could hear the black dog coming. He hums as he trots along. Seems fond of Elizabethan folk tunes. <laughs> but why, Jack said, why would you do that to me? Knowing even as he asked the question, the, knowing even as he asked the question that its answer was obvious. Because we wanted you to see. So you would know, and now you see, and now you know. But I don't want to see, Jack said, and I don't want to know. I just want to set out. I want the sky to be new and the wind fresh on my cheek. I want to feel the red dust scrudging up between my toes. I want to whistle off down the road with, my, with the lunch my mama made slung over a pole and meet an old man who will say, Howdy, Jack, today you're going to meet a giant with two heads. Here's two silver hatchets. That ain't going to happen no more, Jack. The black dog is going to get us all. He's eating all the stories up from the inside. So enjoy it while you can, Jack. It's almost like living, this knowing. Behind him, Jack heard a crashing through the corn too loud to be a maiden. He grabbed the twins by their hands and tried to pull them with him through the wheat. It's no use, Jack. Just let us go. The crashing in the corn grew louder. No, Jack said, squeezing their hands so tightly he was afraid he might turn hurt them. I ain't going to turn you loose. It's fine like this, Jack, said one. It's fine. It's not fine. We're lucky in a way, said the other. We got to be in another story, even if it was with you. We're not weaving baskets and churning butter when nobody never comes. This is better. But the way it ends, Jack said, is the way it ends. The black dog's going to catch us and say whatever it is he has to say and bite us, and that'll be that. Come with me, Jack pleaded. Come with me, and I won't lay a finger on either one of you, I promise. I'll get us a farm. How about that? I'll get us a farm and clear some new ground and sow some seeds and grow some corn and a few tomatoes, and I won't set out no more. We can live happily ever after. Oh, Jack, 
one chided. You don't do happily ever after. I do too, protested Jack. I've done happily ever after lots of times. But then the page turns. The page turns and off you go again. Whatever was coming through the corn was almost upon them. Shut up, Jack said. Just shut up and come on. He tried to jerk the girls after him. Their hands were sweaty, almost hot to the touch, touch callous from weaving and churning. When they pulled back against him, he squeezed harder and felt the delicate bones rubbing together underneath their skin. Ow, said the girl he clutched with his left hand. You're hurting me. You let her go, cried the girl on the right just as she clouted him on the ear. Don't you hurt her no more. Jack dropped the hands of both the girls and rubbed his ringing ear. He said, what the hell did you do that for? I'm just trying to save you. But when he looked up, the girls were gone, just gone, vanished as completely as if they had been imagined along the side of a road and just as quickly forgotten. Thank you.